All right, here we are. This is episode number 89 of the Cozy Corner of Cinema. This is being recorded on Sunday, December 10th, 2023 at 2.45 p.m. And it is a very gloomy sight outside. It's cloudy as all hell, man. Just gray all over. It's been raining like hell for, gosh, about an hour or so. It's been picking up. And it's just a beautiful sight to see. It's just totally a cozy kind of feeling and atmosphere. Makes you want to just kind of stay inside, um, you know, watch a film, get some reading done, get the work done. You got to get done your writing or, you know, whatever it is that you got to do, man. You know, just sort of uh, utilizing that time in a way where, you know, you're not going to go out and, and, you know, just uh, milly around and do nothing, you know. You know, people saying that. Come out, do do this, do that, and and you just gotta be upfront and tell them no way, Jose. This this ain't happening. I gotta make my life's my life's dreams come true, and that ain't gonna happen at a restaurant or at a pub or anything like that. No way, man. Not a chance in hell. But uh, yes, so let's see. I gotta look at my notes here. Let's see what we want to get into first. I'm trying to be a little more organized because I've had been pretty unorganized the past couple weeks or so. I've spent so much going on, so much sad to have got get done. Um, I'm even thinking back when I recorded that Blu-ray episode for December 2023. There were two big titles that I just completely skimmed over. I didn't even see. I, I wanted to talk about, so I guess I'll talk about them briefly here, but I just wanted to mention um, Goodbye Dragon Inn is getting a U.S. Blu-ray. Um, next had a Blu-ray from Second Run, or I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it is Second Run, I believe. And I've talked about Goodbye Dragon Inn before early, early in the show. It's a brilliant film about the uh, last night at this cinema and sort of a couple of characters that uh, inhabit it. It's one where at first you're kind of, you don't totally understand, you know, where certain characters are coming from. And then halfway you get a cer- you start to get a certain feeling for it. Um, and it's just a brilliant, quiet, uh, just brilliant, brilliant film uh, that is coming from Kino. Uh, and I, the the quote they use that kind of makes me chuckle a little bit. It says from a picked upon vericeutical, who has come up on the show many many a time. It says the greatest film of the last hundred twenty five years. It's like man, might as well just say the greatest film ever. It's like you know, I mean, <laughs> what are you talking about, man? It's just the that's such a specific uh, number. It's, it feels been around that long, you know. <laughs> it's like what the hell are you talking about, man? Um, but yeah, that that's coming out then. I also wanted to mention. Uh, the collection coming from Criterion of the Red Balloon and other stories, five films from Albert uh, Lemaris. And I've only seen the Red Balloon, which is about a 30 minute short. It's a terrific, terrific short film. It actually would have made my favorite films of 1956 list. I think it was 56. Uh, I could look that up. Um, but I, was doing, yes, that is right, 1956. I was doing feature films only, but it's a wonderful film that uh, should be seen. And this collection I'm very curious about, because that's the only film from Mr. Albert Lemery's, if I'm saying that correctly, that I've seen. So um, just keep that in mind with those two releases. Um, to keep an eye on those, Goodbye Dragon Inn is, a, is just a masterpiece, and The Red Balloon is just a wonderful film, and, and both... Um, it, it both will be far more uh, uh, suitable to watch and get more out of than just kind of standard uh, generic theatrical fare. I mean, I tell you, I uh, maybe I'll talk about this in a bit. I might, I might talk about this film. I don't know. Um, but I was going to the cinema yesterday uh, to catch a couple of films, and I, I don't typically go to the uh, big sort of chain cinemas just for, you know, there's nothing really there that, that piques my interest. And typically... If I'm going to go out to the cinema, there has to be a reason for it. It's not just a it's not a pastime. There has to be something far more intellectual to get out of it. Um, and I hadn't been in quite some time. I mean, I used to be I used to go to the big cinema a lot. Um, but when I started to become a little more aware of what I wanted to take in and, and the art and the films that I, I wanted to watch, um, that that sort of went by the wayside. And now it's, it's not very often. There's much uh, giant theatrical fair that I, I want to see at a, at a big cinema. And usually I like to support the Ma and Pa cinemas too. You know, I, I did recently see uh, Napoleon, the Ridley Scott film. Um, yeah, because I, I, uh, yeah, because I'm, I'm interested in, you know, a big history guy. And the history of Napoleon is interesting, but I did see that at a 
local Ma and Pa sort of cinema. It was, it was nice. I had a I had a very good conversation with a gentleman after about the film. Uh, very uh, very wise man, very knowledgeable man. Um, but what I'm saying is that I uh, just want to get a sip right there. Make sure my throat is being well maintained. You don't want to have it too dry and it sound like I'm smoking cigarettes or something like that. I mean, you don't you don't want me doing that to your lungs? Hell no, none of that stuff. But it's just wild. I go to the cinema, and uh, I mean, for one, I, I'm I'm pretty out of the loop on contemporary big theatrical films. I, I there was talking on the show a little while ago. I couldn't even think of upcoming big theatrical films coming out. I mean, I can think of plenty of films that were on my radar that you know may or may not play at the big cinemas. You know, I'm thinking of like the new uh, Yaros and Themos film and the new Jonathan Glazer film. And actually, it's funny. I'm thinking, where, where the hell is the new Richard Linklater film? I thought that was gonna come out this year, but. Uh, it looks like not. Uh, the Hitman is with Glenn Powell. Uh, yeah, I thought that was going to come out this year, but I guess it'll have to come out next year. I think that's a Netflix film, too, but I don't don't quote me on that. I might be getting that mixed up with The Killer. They have a similar sort of title. But, uh, like, The Killer should have been, like, a wide theatrical film. But anyway, so... Um, yeah, no, I'm, 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 there are just so many trailers in the cinema. There's so many commercials. There's just so many ads. It's, it's, it's nauseating, man. I don't know any of these films. When I go to, when I'm going to see certain, when I go to when I go to the cinema, I I really don't care to watch the trailers. I'll I read my book until uh, the film starts because I don't need to see trailers, man. I, I know what I need to see and what I don't need to see, uh, and uh, so just, just watching these trailers. It's, I mean, the theater was so dark you couldn't you couldn't read anything. So I'm sitting there and I'm going right. I watch these trailers and it's just it's just it's just all loud. It's all obnoxious, just bombastic trailers. It's just all, it's just nauseating, man. It's just a headache. Um, but they, they did show the trailer for The Iron Claw, which will definitely be watched. It's on my radar. And it was actually the first time I had seen the trailer for The Zone of Interest, the new Jonathan Glazer film, um, which I, I don't I don't totally understand, know what it's about, but that's fantastic. I, I'd rather go in with um, with as little of an idea as possible. I mean, it's Jonathan Glazer. He's just a fantastic filmmaker. Uh, Sandra Hewler's been a... Uh, you know, people have been talking about her lately with Anatomy of a Fall and talking about some of her previous films. And uh, so it's just great. That'll be watched when, when it's uh, available. But, um, yeah, no, you're, you you watch these trailers and it's just like, you, you just, you, these are these are all spectacle films, you know? It's like, nothing wrong with spectacle films, but I don't have any interest in, in spectacle films. You know, I, none of that stuff interests me. It's all um, shallow, passive entertainment and I don't need, you know, shallow, passive entertainment. You know, I don't, I don't need to watch a giant monster movie. I don't need to watch... Just uh, you know, tweaks their own. That's just not for me. So it, you know, and I'm I'm not putting down any any kind of film like that. I'm just saying that being in a setting that I would that I normally wouldn't be in. It's just it was interesting to watch these trailers um, for films I hadn't even been completely aware of, and just being kind of flabbergasted at the uh, the similarity between a lot of them. You know, it just it's very much like. Uh, fast food, you know, kind of cinema, but, um, you know, film is meant to be perceived in many, many a different way. You know, I, I may not be a fan of a lot of spectacle, um, kind of films like that, but I mean, when I see these trailers, I hear the audience kind of laughing at the jokes and, you know, getting into it. And that's cool, man. I mean, my whole thing is that, you know, it's, you, you may, you don't, I mean, have people influence your opinion to a certain extent, but ultimately have your own opinion on these things. I mean, even though I'm not really crazy about some of these movies coming out and these trailers, I mean, I hear the audience laughing at some of the jokes or they're, you know, reacting to the film, and I'm like, all right, they're getting something out of it that I'm not. So that's ultimately what uh, matters is what we're all getting out of um, uh, uh, each and every film. I don't know if you guys can hear that rain outside. It's definitely picked up again. It's wild as hell. Look at that. You just look at the trees and uh, you just see the little droplets of rain. It's like it's like a picture of all the color taken out. It's it's just fantastic. It looks it looks beautiful outside. I love the rain. I love driving in the rain. If I have good windshield wipers. I was in a situation recently where I was driving a car that wasn't mine. I did not have good windshield wipers. And, and brother, let me tell you, that was a that was a that was a very uh, focused driving session to say the least. Um, but either way, um, so yeah, the other night I decided to, uh, I, I just recently rewatched uh, Oppenheimer on 4K, and I, I wanted to, to take a look at that 72-minute documentary that was on the, the uh, Blu-ray. Um, it's on the Blu-ray disc. I, I would assume it's on the, the, Blu-ray, the Blu-ray release as well, because um, I got the 4K, and it comes with just the, it's a, it's a three-disc set, but it was a, a wonderful 
uh, documentary. I mean, it, it's multiple parts. It's not like a featured documentary. It's not like they, you know, it, it's it, multiple segments focusing on different aspects, but just seeing kind of uh, the the uh, enormity that it takes to make a project like this, just being able to balance everything going on between the visual effects and the score and the acting and the extras and all that. I mean, just the amount of people that work on these films, it's, I mean, it is, it's, it's hard to grasp some, grasp some time on a lot of these big kind of, uh, uh, Hollywood sort of films like that. And it's wild because, you know, cause so how many of them people spend, you know, all this time just for it to, for a film to just, be forgotten or ultimately not for anything, but then you look at a, a film like this, it's actually made by somebody with a vision, uh, made by an actual filmmaker. It's not made by a committee. It's not made by, you know, uh, just like, well, we have to meet this demographic because we'll make this amount of money in this time. You know, uh, it's just crazy to put all that time into, into something like that, that you, you know, your heart's not into it and you're meeting a certain agenda, um, to make money, you know, or to appeal to a certain audience or, I mean, these films don't, don't last the, uh, don't, don't stand the test of time. You're not going to be talking about, you know, some generic superhero film that came out a year or two ago. I mean, you're going to be talking about films that are actually made by like filmmakers. That's why people still talk about, you know, like, uh, these films like, you know, Fury Road and stuff like Mad Max, cause it's actually made by George Miller who had a, had a vision for this sort of thing. And, and yeah, it's a spectacle film undoubtedly, but it's a spectacle film that is made with care and intent, um, that a lot of these film, that a lot of these films that come out just just um, I don't want to say they aren't because I'm not going to make a broad kind of general statement like that. But ultimately, I think that there is a, a far more kind of uh, process to a lot of these uh, films that that blend together. But that that documentary was very well done. It was uh, that was on the, the Blu-rays. I want to give a heads up on that. Uh, that if it is worth buying the uh, release for one to have it and two for that documentary alone. I think there was another Q and A on that Blu-ray as well that I haven't watched yet, but that'll be watched in due time. I chose to watch this again instead of watching the film again because I had just seen it again recently, so I didn't think it was appropriate to watch it yet again in such a short amount of time. Because there's so many films that get watched. I mean, it's just it's, it's overwhelming. There's just at all times there's just so much to do in every front. That's why, you know, I, I don't get bored by anything, man. I don't, I don't, you know, people they just they're they're glued to the telephone. They're scrolling through on social media, and you're just like, oh my god, you hear what this person said, you hear, oh, you can't believe what this person did. And I'm like, man, if I have any time at all. I'm working on something, man. You know, I'm working on whether it's writing, whether it's reading, whether it's getting these projects done. I mean, I, I mean, even recently I had extra time in a situation where I couldn't write. So I got some filming done. And now I've been working on that project. So it's just great. You know, it's just finding these nuggets of time because uh, it's just so precious and so valuable that to just, uh, you know, the idea of just being bored or just like, you know, oh, what do you want to do today? I don't know. Let's just go to the store, look around, or let's, uh, you know, go to a restaurant and eat, you know. If that's what you want to do, man, then you got to go for it. You got to be the the uh, the one-man crew of your life, man. You got to direct this motion picture that has a good ending, has a happy ending, because um, if you don't, then you're going to be walking around one day thinking to yourself, what the hell did I do with all this time lost, you know. It's just, it's just nonsense, Um but, uh, you know, with that said, but uh, speaking of which, I wanted to uh, uh, mention that uh, people are talking about it, but uh, hearing the passing of uh, fantastic actor Ryan O'Neill, uh, it was such a, 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 I didn't want to say a shock, because there's nothing that, you know, I wasn't shocked by it. I'm not, like, expecting it. You know, we all got to go at some point, but uh, I had just recently watched for the first time The Driver from 1973, Walter Hill, uh, with Ryan O'Neill in the lead um, as The Driver, with a memorable performance by not only him, but Bruce Dern as well. Bruce Dern playing a cop who's really trying to get him. And it's, I mean, it, it, this is a case as well. This is a spectacle film, but it's a spectacle film made by somebody who actually wants to make this sort of film, who actually has craft in his in his in his directing who has a technique when he's directing action, these exciting action sequences that are, that are visually pleasing, but they also drive the story forward. You have Ryan O'Neill in this film who's a getaway driver and Bruce Stern um, is really on his tail. really wants to get him. I mean, the, the plan in the film doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I mean, R Bruce Stern is talking about setting him up, getting these guys to set him up. The, you know, one of the guys I think like robbed a bank uh, or, or was going to jail. And he's like, well, you get him to, to, um, you know, be your getaway driver, and we'll get him, and and so they have to go through this whole process. And I'm thinking, the second he says yes, you got him right there. It takes some time to do it, but you know, it's, it's whatever. It's besides the point. It's, it's an enjoyable, enjoyable film. Uh, also with Isabella Rossellini. I'm sorry, Isabella Johnny. 
I always get the names mixed up. Uh, this was her first American film, I believe, who apparently I read was not uh, happy with the end result on it. Um, Isabella Johnny has been in many, many a film, of course, from Possession. And um, is it The Bride Wore Black that she's in? What's the true Phil film that she's in? Uh, gosh, it's going to bother me now. I'm not going to look it up, though, because I haven't seen uh, Bride Wore Black, so I would have nothing to say on it regardless. Um, it's not Mississippi Mermaid. One of them... You know what? Yeah, you can look up whatever film that is. It's, it's one of one of Truffaut's films. But it's a wonderful film. Walter Hill is just such a fantastic filmmaker. Just talking about the Warriors on the Blu-ray episode. And, you know, uh, he's done like Brewster's Millions and uh, Extreme Prejudice. And he's just he's such a wonderful, wonderful filmmaker. And um, I'm hoping that uh, I'd love to get a, a 4K of this in the stage. I think this does have a 4K overseas, or this is a Blu-ray. But in the U.S., this doesn't currently have a release. But um, wonderful stuff as well. But Ryan O'Neill's also been in many great films. Barry Lyndon, of course, which is one of Stanley Kubrick's best films. Love Story with Ali McGraw, which uh, is a great film as well. Uh, a film I've talked about in the show, Tough Guys Don't Dance, uh, by Norman Mailer. It's such an interesting film. I really like that one. Uh, the one of his one of his films that I watched that I know Larry Kurzuski uh, is a is a fan of. Of, uh, has a fondness for that wasn't uh, really my kind of film, but it was. I'm glad I watched either way. It was uh, what the hell? I think it's called So Fine from 19 from the mid 80s. I mean, it's a ridiculous film. He makes these uh, these these jeans that have the uh, you know the butt cheeks like clear. It, it's ridiculous, man. But it, it, I think Ryan O'Neill was an actor who had, who had a lot more range. Than I think was given to him. Uh, you mean know, also of course the Bogdanovic stuff, you know, working with like Paper Moon and uh, What's Up Doc and stuff. You know, we just lost uh, Bogdanovic a couple years ago or so. So it's a shame, man. But Ryan O'Neill is a fantastic actor, and now that he's in the news again, people are going to be talking about these films. They're going to be going back into the public conscious, going like, "Oh yeah, I never saw Barry Lyndon," or "Oh yeah, I've never seen uh, you know The Driver." I'm, I'm going to watch these films now, and and uh, you know, it's unfortunate that he has to pass, but he served a very very well life. He's entertained many people. He's brought us such joy. I mean, he was such a fantastic actor. So we pay our respects to the late, great Ryan O'Neill. Get your drink, uh, or if you don't have a drink or a glass, just metaphorically raise your glass. You can't see right now. I'm actually literally raising the glass right now. Uh, to Mr. Ryan O'Neill, I'll have a sip of this beverage right here. So uh, God bless him, man. Mm. That is so cool, man. That is so cool. I'd love to get a 4K of Barry Lyndon at some point. That is such a wonderful, wonderful film. Uh, that was one of the last Kubrick films, the big ones I needed to see. I think I've seen almost just about everything. Just about there. I think I have one. No, I have two more I have to see. Not counting his documentary shorts, but um, it's, yeah, this was a later one I got to, and it's just one that I'd never intentionally put off. I've had the Criterion Blu-ray for, for years. Um, it's just one that I just never got around to. I think, uh, you know, it's a film that, not only this film, but I think films of this kind that I, I think it, you do need to kind of wait to watch to get it, to gain an appreciation for. If you're watching a slow kind of period piece film when you're a young kid and your attention span is maybe not what it is, I mean, you're not. If you ask Joe Schmo to watch a film like this, who you know has, who can't you know can't read a page of a book without blank you know spacing out and doing something, then you know it's just it's just not going to happen. These are kinds of films that you need to kind of wait on. And, uh, you know, the older you get and the more art you consume where you're, you're accustomed to films that take their time with their shots, that films that really trust the audience to kind of bear with them. And, and I think that's kind of a lost, not necessarily a lost art because that's definitely not the case. There's plenty, plenty of brilliant filmmakers still doing stuff. I mean, I just talked about before I picked upon Verisutical is one of my favorite filmmakers working and his work is, is, uh, you know, it's, it's very, you, you really got to stay with it, man. It's like, it's not going to hold your hand and, and, and make you make it a comfortable experience, but his films are brilliant, man. Uncle Boon Me and, and Memoria. And one of his earlier films I saw that I'm blanking on the name of, I do apologize, but I'm talking about you. You ain't gonna go to the to the uh, you know you ain't gonna go to the AMC's or the Regals or the Cinemarks and see you know a film like uh, like Barry Lyndon. Now it's just not gonna happen. Even Napoleon, which is a film that I thought was okay, but I think I was far more interested in the character stuff rather than the spectacle um, of it all. I mean, the action sequences were, were very well shot, actually, like the Battle at Waterloo, and it, it, it was all brutal and very well done. I mean, get rid of all the historical inaccuracies throughout the film. I was just far more interested in some of the quieter character stuff. But, but you know, it's sort of... Uh, tastes are going to vary, and that's the great thing about it. You know, if somebody asked me recently that we were talking about Killers of the Flower Moon and they hadn't seen it, and they said, uh, oh, would you recommend it? And I said, well, hey, man, I can tell you this. I mean, I got a lot out of it, but, 
you may not. If you're curious to see it, then you should see it. And I say it with all films. Even films like I, you know, I don't like. I mean, there's been films I've seen this year where I'm just like, wow, that was just terrible, man. But if somebody was like, hey, should, should I watch this film? I'm going to say, if you want to watch it, then you should watch it. I never want to steer anybody away from a film or any kind of art that they may get something out of it that I don't. Much in the same way, if I like something that somebody else doesn't, you know, I, I want to tell people like, hey, you should check this film out. Cause, you know, I, I think this is a solid film. And, and um, you know, I, I take all my recommend, I take all film recommendations seriously for, for um, 99% of them. I mean, every film, no matter how long it takes, I'll watch. I mean, if you're, you know, if somebody recommends me something like, you know, like a, like a, a superhero thing, you know, it's just bad. It's not for me. I'll, I'll, I'll say up front, I'll be like, Hey, you know, I thank you for, for the recommendation, but I, I already know this is, this is will not be for me unless there's something exceptional actually about it. And I don't mean, and when I say exceptional, I don't mean like, you know, I, I need something real out of it. I don't need spectacle, but there are films where people recommend and I'll go, Oh, I'm not familiar with that film or, Oh, I've, you know, I've been wanting to watch that. So, and it'll maybe sometimes it takes years to get to them, but I take them seriously because like, so you recommend films to people and they don't ever watch them. It's just like, brother, why did I even waste my time trying to convince you with this? But uh, either way, you know, it kind of went off on a little bit of a tangent there. It seems to be sort of the uh, main kind of point that happens a lot in this show. But uh, yeah, I guess I will, uh, I guess I'll talk about the film I did see theatrically. I saw two films theatrically. Yesterday, I saw, well, I've, you know, in the afternoon, I saw Godzilla Minus One, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a well-made film, it's, you know, it's got plenty of spectacle in it, um, some some interesting character moments, ultimately, it's not really for me, um, I had I had no intention of seeing it theatrically, not in the slightest, but I had acquaintances whose opinions that I trust, and whose uh, film tastes I, I, I trust as well, who uh, were very high on the film, so I watched it, and um, I liked it, it just, it just, to me, there's no longevity to it. I've, I've, I'm not going to be thinking about it anytime soon again. It's already fading from my mind. But the film I did like quite a bit was uh, the new film from... I want to pull up this director's name because it's a foreign director and I don't know his name. But he did a film that I saw earlier this year that I liked a lot. This is from filmmaker Christopher Borgley. Or Borgley. His new uh, American film... Starring Nicolas Cage, uh, Dream Scenario, and his earlier, the film I saw of of his earlier in the year, which I think was, I want to make sure, okay, not his debut, because he's done many, many, many work before this, um, but his film Sick of Myself, which I may have talked about on the show, I really don't know, but it's a fantastic film just about these two just total nar- extreme narcissists, man. They just go out of their way to just be terrible people. The opening scene kind of sets the precedent. Um, and, you know, the the main actor, the the girl, um, Signe, played by Christine K- Kuja Thorpe. I mean, she's just a total, like, total narcissist and is digging herself deeper and deeper. But it's such a wonderful film to watch of just how low these characters will sink to for their own satisfaction. It's just a wonderful watch. Um, and his new film, Dream Scenario, is sort of in line of that, of just sort of this character who has everything... Well, I mean, I don't want to give away the whole plot or anything like that, but I will say of Nicolas Cage in this film who plays his character, Paul Matthews. He's working as a professor at this college. He has tenure. He's, you know, he's kind of a... He's, he's an average kind of guy. No one really thinks, you know, too high of him. He's just sort of, you know, he wants to write this book, but he hasn't even written anything of it yet. But he has had some complications in his past with somebody who may have plagiarized some of his work. But anyways, one day this phenomenon happens where people start seeing him in their dreams. And he's, and, you know, the opening scene sequence of the film, you're like, what? What's going on with this man? And then you see, oh, it's a dream. And then, oh, people are seeing him in his dreams and these terrible things are happening. And But he's not doing anything. But he's just standing there. And he starts to gain this sort of, uh, this status of people, oh, you know, we love you. You know, you're a celebrity and we're going to, you know, you're going to be on social media and stuff. It's all great. And then the turning of the tides and the darker elements of it. And, you know, it's not... I wouldn't say it, it, it just falls short of being great. I think the film does have its issues in terms of plot progression. In the third act, I will say that it does meander just a little bit. There were a couple times where it started to feel a little repetitive. But overall, I think that um, this director, um, Christopher Borgley, has such an interesting vision for his films, man. The way that he does these films, they're comedic, but they are uh, they have an element of mean-spiritedness to them, but it, st- it never becomes 
uh, unenjoyable to watch. Because even when some of the darker elements come into the film and, and Paul's life isn't turning out how he thought it would be, it's still very, very enjoyable and very funny at times. A big part of that is because I think this is one of Nicolas Cage's strongest performances in his whole filmography, and that's including films like Leaving Las Vegas and Birdie and Red Rock West and just these really great performances in the past couple of years. You know, he's still doing a lot of the, uh, you know, the VOD stuff, which is, you know, which is fine and all that, but then he does a film like, you know, Pig or does Joe or even a film like Mandy that it wasn't really for me, um, you know, does it, gives, gives a good performance there. Or Color Out of Space, which was a good film. And uh, what I like about this film is that it feels closer. The, the comparison, I would say, in terms of how his character behaves is probably something closer to his character in Adaptation, where he's this nervous kind of guy. He stutters. He makes sometimes inappropriate jokes, or people kind of mis- misinterpret what he says. But you do kind of like him. But then when people start dogging on him, it's like it's just it, it really kind of breaks your heart because this is a guy who really didn't do anything. But now everybody's suddenly against him. Man, I should also say that, that when I'm talking about the way the film is directed, these really great dreams sequences as well i mean they feel you know when, when you're when you're watching a film i, I think dream sequences in films are, are often so difficult to do and this one as well i mean it's, it's everybody has different kinds of dreams and all that but it's just the, the way they they edit them and the way that there's a part where he's like talking in front of his class and his students are talking about some of the dreams they've had of him it's all great and um, i should also say as well the the ending of this film i mean it might be my favorite I don't know if we want to say fair. I mean, this and Oppenheimer are definitely tied to being my favorite endings of the year. The way this film ends, I mean, it really was it was perfect. It was like, there's one shot uh, that, I mean, it's not even a spoiler or anything like that, but it's characters are walking down a street and the way that it's angled and what's happening in the background and, and what's happening and what the characters are, are wearing, it's, it's it's beautiful, but it's funny, and then the narration over it is just perfect. I mean, and the thing with this and, and Sick of Myself is that I think both of them just fall short of being great, but I think this director is doing such interesting work that I'm completely on board with whatever he does next. I haven't, this is, these are the only two films that I've seen. He's done a handful of shorts. Um, he did a feature uh, in 2017 called Drib, but he's done a lot of shorts like Syndromes, and It's Not a Phase, and Softcore, and Ear. And, uh, but it's very cool stuff, man. I, I, I'm going to tell you, you know, it's, it's like this is uh, just a total highlight of the year, a, a total joy to watch. It's just it's just great to watch, man. I, I really did enjoy this one immensely, and I got more out of this than, than I did, you know, maybe some other kind of big Hollywood films, man. That, you know, that, I've not watched a lot of those, but a film like this, I'll make my track out to the big cinema and go see something like this, man, because I know I'm going to – I mean, maybe I don't know, but I'll, there's a likelihood that I'll get more out of it than just your kind of generic whatever, you know. Um, but I got a couple minutes left, so I guess I'll go to – wrap this up here some of these things here i didn't quite get to but that's all right there's always next week uh, hopefully man hopefully there's a next week nothing's guaranteed in this life so you might as well take advantage of the time you got uh while you still got it man it ain't nothing guaranteed but the fact you're gonna die and you know people get so scared of that stuff and i'm like hey man bring it on you know i, I got stuff to do but i'm gonna make it i'm gonna make uh every day count i'm gonna do what it is that i need to do and want to do man it's just it's just a beautiful beautiful time to be alive and this is a beautiful time of the year to be alive as well Great time to stay in, get the work done, uh, get some reading or watching or writing or work on your craft, your art, whatever it is, man. It's just take full, full advantage of it. Get rid of all the social kind of milieu nonsense in your life. It's just it's just not going to do anything for you. Unless you want to, then go for it, man. I, and no one, no one should tell you how to live your life as long as you're not hurting yourself or anybody else. But that's all I got, man. All right. Thank you guys for listening yet again. Uh, have a fantastic rest of your day whenever you're listening to this, and I'll be back soon.